Thank you very much for being here. My name is David Chung, and today we're going to be talking about a wide range of topics pertaining to Einstein, quantum theory, uh, Darwinian natural selection, and a few other things. Um, thanks to Len Klikunas for inviting me. Uh, we've been corresponding a little bit, and he read the book that I'm going to be publishing, and uh, appreciated very much the opportunity to talk to you. Before we, go any, before we go any further, I want to apologize in advance if I offend anybody by saying some of the things that I'm going to be saying. Uh, I don't want to bruise your ego, but that might happen. If there's anything that I can say as a defense, I'm an equal opportunity offender, and I may offend everybody. So we're going to be talking about God does not play dice, how we can achieve final knowledge that nature is governed by lawful design, not chance, randomness, and probability. A word about the title, God Does Not Play Dice. You may know that uh, Einstein, this was his very famous phrase. Uh, he wrote a couple letters to Max Born, and one of them said, you believe in the God who plays dice, and I in complete law and order. Even the great initial success of the quantum theory does not make me believe in the fundamental dice game, although I'm well aware that our younger colleagues interpret this as a consequence of senility. No doubt the day will come when we will see whose instinctive attitude was the correct one. And at another time he wrote to Bourne, the theory says a lot, but does not really bring us any closer to the secret of the old one. I, at any rate, am convinced that he is not playing at dice. Uh, he had a long-standing quote unquote feud with his colleagues about randomness and chance and probability and things like that and we're going to get into that. Was an undisputed genius wrong about nature and reality? As you can see from the slide plus the magazine I'm holding up, Einstein was chosen as Time Magazine's person of the century in 1999. So obviously he's considered an undisputed genius. And as I mentioned, today scientists say there is evidence that God plays dice and that nature is inherently probabilistic and randomness is all the rage. Was Einstein wrong or will he have the last laugh? I've decided to appoint myself as Einstein's pit bull, uh, partly because of what Sarah Palin's been doing lately with the word. But as you may know, um, Thomas Huxley was Darwin's pit bull. I don't see anybody else defending Einstein, so I'm going to do it. Here's an overview of what we're going to be talking about today. I'm going to show that the belief in chance, randomness, and probability is based on assumption, not evidence. And I'm going to insist that the scientific assumption happens to be wrong. And then we're going to look at some of the implications for free will, uh, probability, regret, and things like that. Now, the first bullet, the belief in chance is based on an assumption. In my view, that is not a debatable statement in the sense that the following is a debatable statement. Who would be the better presidential ticket? Sarah Palin and what's his name? Or Joe Biden and what's his name? That you can debate all day long. The belief in chance, randomness and probability, we're going to see is based on an assumption. And, and even though there are many scientists who say that there is evidence and there are facts to support that, they happen to be incorrect. Let me introduce some unfamiliar concepts. Actualism is a philosophical statement from a fellow named A.J. Ayer, which says that the actual is the only possibility. Contrafactual definiteness has to do with believing in things that are not present and saying that they could be present, or the belief that it could be otherwise. For example, I am holding this red die right now, and I, I didn't pick up the green one. Now, could I have picked up the green one? Many of you say, would say, yes, I could have picked up the green one, but I'm not. So the belief that I could have picked up the green one is called counterfactual definiteness. Uh, as it applies to you, you are sitting here right now correct? And some of you are saying, I wish I had slept over my hangover and, and skipped this class. But the fact that you're here means you're here, and the idea that you could be sleeping at home is, is counterfactual definiteness. 
Another concept is the hypothesis of equal a priori probabilities. And we're going to get into this a little bit later, but basically, hypothesis here means belief, postulate, it's, a, it's an educated guess. You probably remember that that's a definition for hypothesis. Hypothesis of equal a priori probabilities has to do with when you toss coins or when you throw dice or, or when you shuffle cards, uh, lots of other things that nature doesn't care about the outcome. So the, all outcomes are equally likely. And we'll get into that a little bit. Narrative dependent studies has to do with our view of things and how we create stories or explanations for things that we observe. There's a book that I recommend called The Black Swan by a fellow named Nicholas Nassim Taleb. Uh, I don't quite agree with his general viewpoint about randomness, but he has some excellent points about our tendency, and by our, I mean humans, the human ten tendency to come up with explanations for why things are the way they are. And we see it everywhere. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Chance and randomness, we're products of our cultural conditioning. And there are early Greek ideas about chance, fate, destiny, luck. Uh, I don't know if they use the term randomness, but Democritus, who was a philosopher, talked about chance and necessity and also talked about atoms floating around. Dyke and Fortuna, Anake and Moira. You may not know those people from Greek legend and Greek mythology. Anake was the mother of Moira. Moira is a you know, name some of us have. Moira has to do with fate and destiny and uh, predestination. And the Greeks were very involved in thinking about human freedom versus fate versus the gods. Now, this is 2,500 years ago. And Democritus, chance and necessity were things that he introduced to the people. And there are lots of other philosophers from that time who talked about these ideas. Now we move forward to uh, 2008, and the same ideas have evolved to be quote-unquote scientific. There's a new book out called The Drunkard's Walk by a fellow named Leonard Mlodino, and the subtitle is How Randomness Rules Our Lives. So he sees chance everywhere. Uh, Michael Starbird is a <coughs> professor at the University of Texas at Austin who has a great course on probability. It's called, What Are the Chances Probability Made Clear? And some of the, the uh, chapters are Our Random World, Probability Defined, The Nature of Randomness, Probability Where We Don't Expect It, Believe It or Not, Bayesian Probability, and Probability Everywhere. And he has the phrase, the chance combination of genes that produced you. All of you were born. Correct. He says it was a chance combination of genes. And we're going to look at that line of thinking a little bit later. The last quote here is from Natalie Angier, who is a writer for the New York Times. And she wrote a book called The Canon. And it's called A Whirligig Tour of the Beautiful Basics of Science. And she talks about a lot, she interviewed a lot of scientists and talks about a lot of current scientific theory. And her, one of her statements is, you have, of course, a 50% chance of tossing a head or a tail with each throw. In other words, a probability of 0.5. So it's, obviously she's talking about the coin toss. We're going to see that all of these are assumptions, not quote unquote facts. 